Assalamu alaikum, dear brothers and sisters, and welcome to another episode of the life of Prophet Muhammad. Uh, continuing our discussion, I'd like to shed some light uh, in this episode on the, the Prophet's ancestral line. In order to appreciate who the Prophet was, especially considering that Arabia was a, uh, a tribal culture, and it's a culture where who your forefathers were essentially determined your social status. So to understand who the prophet was and the status that he occupied in Arabian society, it's imperative that we speak a little bit about the, the family that he hailed from. Indeed, the prophet sallallahu alaihi hailed from the most noble ancestors. In fact, we have a, a statement by Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam in Nahjul Balagha in Sermon 214, where he says, وَأَشْهَدُ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا عَبْدُهُ وَرَسُولُهُ And I bear witness that Muhammad is his servant and messenger. وَسَيِّدُ عِبَادِ And that Muhammad is the master of, of God's creation. كُلَّمَا نَسَخَ اللَّهُ نَسَخَ اللَّهُ الْخَلْقَ فِرْقَتَيْنِ Ja'alahu fi khayrihima. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, he says, whenever God divided the line of descent, he put him in the better one. So from the time of Adam, you know, Adam had children and their children had children. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would place the life seed of the Prophet in the loins of the most noble of every generation. So Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib highlighting the nobility of the Prophet's ancestors. He says, whenever God divided the line of descent, he put him, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, in the better one. Now, of course, the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, is an Arabian Arab. God, according to traditions, sent 124 thousand prophets and we know that there were a number of them who were Arabs you know we know that uh, Prophet Hud was an Arab Prophet Saleh was an Arab and some narrations mention that Shu'aib was of, of Arabian descent and of course the final messenger of God uh, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was an Arab now when you look at the history of Arabs Arabs can be classified into three distinct categories. There's this uh, false assumption that the Arabs are, are the descendants of, uh, of Ismail, and they really came into, into being after, uh, after Ismail. But in reality, we have three categories of Arabs. We have uh, what is known as the perished or the extinct Arabs, who are known as the Arab al Ba'idah. We have uh, uh, the pure Arabs, al Arab al Ariba. And then we have number three, the Arabized Arabs, al Arab al Musta'ariba. And all three of them are actually mentioned in the Quran and they play a significant role uh, in the history of Islam. Now, beginning with the, the perished Arabs, al Arab al Ba'ida. Al Arab al Ba'idah are, uh, are the, essentially the descendants of Prophet Nuh. And they include the ancient tribes of Ad and Thamud, which are referenced in many verses in the Quran. So the, the civilizations of Ad and Thamud were ancient uh, Arab uh, civilizations. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Fussilat, verses 15 to 18, He describes how both of these tribes perished for rejecting uh, their messengers. And you find that the, the extinct Arabs, the extinct tribes of Ad and Thamud are an integral part of uh, early Arabian history. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks of the, the tribes of Ad, and Thamud, the, the Arabs of, uh, of Mecca, they were familiar with these ancient peoples. So you find that the Ad 
the tribe of Ad settled in the area which is current, uh, which is which currently uh, occupies the map. Which is, if you look at today's map, uh, it it includes Yemen and uh, and Oman. And Allah Subhanahu wa Taala mentions that the tribe of Ad uh, was destroyed by a ferocious wind after they ignored the warnings of Prophet Hud alayhi salam. So Ad again, it's an Arabian tribe. Prophet Hud, an Arabian prophet, and uh, this was a civilization that was uh, was decimated, and hence they are known as Al Arab Al Ba'idah, the perished Arabs. Similarly, you have the Thamud, who succeeded the tribe of Ad, and they inher- inhabited an area that was further to the north of the Arabian Peninsula, and uh, the Thamud, unfortunately, they faced. A similar fate uh, because of their iniquities and because they rejected the uh, the warnings and the teachings of Prophet Saleh. So you have Ad and Thamud, and you have Prophet Hud and Prophet Saleh, who are uh, among the uh, the ancient uh, Arabs who uh, who essentially uh, were uh, were destroyed uh, by divine punishment in the forms of uh, of uh, of fierce winds. And, uh, and thunderbolts. So that's with respect to the the first category of the Arabs, al Arab al You have the extinct or the perished uh, Arabs. So it's important to remember that when we speak about Arabs, you have to remember that the that Arabs existed uh, before the time of uh, of Ismail. That they existed, uh, you know, much earlier, and uh, the Quran mentions. The, the tribes of Ad and Thamud as uh, as Arabian tribes uh, who who were recipients of prophets, but unfortunately they rejected the messengers and consequently uh, they were punished by God. The second category of Arabs are known as the pure Arabs, Al Arab Al Ariba, and they're also known as the Qahtani Arabs. Now today. Any person who identifies as Arab is either going to be Qahtani or Adnani, as we'll as we'll speak. So it seems that there were some Arabs who survived. A handful of them presumably survived uh, the, in the tribe of Ad and Thamud, and they continue to uh, to procreate. And there, then, and therefore, you have uh, the pure Arabs, the Qahtani Arabs who settled in Yemen, and they actually founded the empire of Sheba. And this is mentioned in the Quran, the, uh, the people of Seba. If you, uh, many of you may be familiar with the, the story of Sulaiman and Bilqis, which is mentioned in the Quran. Uh, Bilqis was uh, a queen who ruled over Yemen and she ruled over Seba. She's known as the queen of Sheba. And Sheba was, an, an Arabian uh, civilization. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, in Surah Al-Naml, he mentions when Prophet Sulaiman's hudhud, his, uh, his messenger returned to his court to describe the Arabs of Yemen. So Bilqis was an Arabian uh, queen and the people of Seba were, uh, were Arabs. And the Quran here mentions uh, the... Uh, the statement of the uh, the hudhud, where he says, uh, He says to Sulaiman that I've just come back from the land of Sheba, and I have an accurate report. Inni tamlikuhum. I found a woman there who was ruling over them. So it seems that, you know, it's possible that this may have been uh, a matriarchal uh, society. You have a, a, a woman. Who is uh, who's ruling? Uh, and uh, she has every necessary resource of authority, and she also has a magnificent throne. And of course, this uh, this particular uh, civilization, they were polytheists, they were sun worshippers, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala mentions. Uh, uh, her conversion to monotheism at the hands of uh, of uh, of Sulaiman 
So the pure Arabs are known as Qahtani Arabs. Now, why are they known as Qahtan and who is Qahtan? So Qahtan uh, was a man, according to historians, who lived between the period of Nuh and Ibrahim. And uh, this Qahtan, this individual, according to some, he had an, a son by the name of Ya'rub, which is presumably where we get the name Arab from. Arab perhaps comes from the name of, uh, of Qahtan's son, who is uh, who's Ya'rub. So the Arabs before Ibrahim descended from Ya'rub. So, so again, you have the, the ancient Arabs, the, uh, the, the perished Arabs, the Ad and Thamud, who were destroyed. Presumably there were some individuals who survived. Who then um, later on formed the uh, the uh, the empire of of Sheba, and and then you have uh, the uh, the Qahtani Arabs, and these are the Arabs who existed before the time of uh, of uh, of Ibrahim. So what you see with the the land of Sheba is that that empire essentially deteriorated. And the descendants of, of Seba, the descendants of, of Sheba, they split into two competing tribes. You have Himyar and you have Kahlan. The Himyarites, they stayed in Yemen, while the Kahlan, which is the other half of the, uh, which is the other group of the Arabs, they spread throughout the uh, Arabian Peninsula. And then you see that the, the tribes of Aus and Khazraj, who, who later on occupy Yathrib, and they receive the Prophet when he makes his hijrah to Medina. They're from, uh, from that group, the Kahlan tribe, which, uh, which originates back to the, uh, the, the time of, uh, of Queen Sheba. So, so you have the, the perished Arabs, you have the pure Arabs, and then you have the Arabized Arabs. Al-Arab al Now the Arabized Arabs are considered the direct descendants of Ismail. And they are known as Adnani Arabs. And the Prophet ﷺ is an Adnani Arab. He is an Arabized Arab. Now, what does it mean when we say Arabized Arabs? Now, the, the story of this third group of Arabs, it actually begins with Ismail's father, with Ibrahim, who essentially founded the, uh, the city of Mecca because Mecca was a barren land. After Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed Ibrahim with his first son, Ismail, he receives revelation to take Hajar, his mother, and the infant son from Philistine, from Palestine, and he places them in Mecca. And Mecca at that time was a, a desolate land. And you can see in Surah Ibrahim, Surah 14, ayah number 37, you see the dua of Ibrahim when he places Hajar and Ismail in Mecca, in the Arab lands. He says, رَبَّنَا إِنِّي أَسْكَنْتُ مِنْ ذُرِّيَّةِ بِوَادٍ غَيْرِ ذِي زَرْعٍ عِنْدَ بَيْتِكَ الْمُحَرَّمِ رَبَّنَا لِيُقِيمُ الصَّلَاةِ فَاجْعَلْ أَفْئِدَةً, فاجعل أفئدة مِنْ النَّاسِ تَهْوِي إِلَيْهِمْ وَارْزُقْهُمْ مِنَ الثَّمَرَاتِ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَشْكُرُونَ Ibrahim says, our Lord, I've settled some of my descendants in this barren valley next to your sacred house so they can, our Lord, establish prayer. So make some people sympathetic towards them and supply them with fruits so they can learn to be thankful. So Hajar and Ismail, they settle in this desert and they, and they make a life for themselves in Mecca. Now, Ismail, Ibrahim, Hajar, they're not Arabs. What happens is that the tribe of Jurhum, which is an Arabian tribe, they are known as pure Arabs. They pass through the region. Ismail السلام, is introduced to a woman from the tribe of Jurhum, and he ends up marrying her. And some historians say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that he, that he, that one of the descendants of Ismail 
His name was Adnan. So the, the Arabized Arabs are essentially the descendants of the offspring of Ismail, whose name was Adnan. So they so he became the namesake of the Adnanian Arabs, and they remained in the central Arabian Peninsula. And you have the tribes of Hawazin, of Thaqif, and Quraysh. All of them go back to Adnan, who is from the progeny of Ismail. So therefore you find that the Prophet ﷺ was an Adnani Arab. He was an Arabized Arab. And as we mentioned earlier, the tribes of, of Aus and Khazraj, who, who are to become the, the residents of Medina, they are uh, Al Arab, they are Qahbani. Uh, Arabs. So, just to understand uh, some of the differences between the uh, the Arab tribes throughout the uh, the Arabian Peninsula. Now, there is a there is a very beautiful tradition that's mentioned in Sunni and Shia hadith sources, where the Prophet ﷺ himself speaks of the way in which God chose uh, his ancestors and how his ancestors are in fact divinely selected to carry his, uh, his life seed. So the Prophet ﷺ, he says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ اصْطَفَى إِسْمَعِيلَ مِنْ وُلْدِ إِبْرَاهِيم That verily God chose Ismail from the children of Ibrahim. And this, this is an indication that, that Ismail was superior to his siblings. Because as Amir al-Mu'mineen says, that, you know, whenever God split the line of descent, he placed the prophet in the better one. So if, if Ishaq was superior to uh, Ismail, Allah would have placed Rasulullah in the in his line of descent. So it seems from these types of narrations that that Ismail was in fact uh, he occupied uh, a higher spiritual station than his uh, than his siblings. So the Prophet says, "Verily, God chose Ismail from the children of Ibrahim." And God chose, he chose Kinana from the children of Ismail. وَاسْطَفَى قُرَيْشًا مِنْ بَنِي Kinana, And he chose Quraysh from the children of Kinana. And Quraysh is actually the name of an individual. It's the title of an individual and we'll speak about that shortly. وَاسْطَفَى هَاشِمًا مِنْ قُرَيْشٍ And God chose Hashim, who is the great-great-grandfather of the Prophet, he chose him from the children of Quraysh. Wastafani min Hashim, and he chose me from Hashim. So you see that Allah chooses the cream of the crop to be the ancestors and the forefathers of our blessed Prophet Muhammad. Now you may be asking, what's why are we spending so much time? speaking about the Prophet's uh, lineage. Now, as I indicated earlier, a person's status in Arabian culture is dictated by the nobility of their birth. In fact, you can even see this in the, the battles uh, throughout uh, the history of the Arabs. Even even the battles that took place during the uh, in the uh, during the the spread of Islam, you see that many warriors, when they would engage in combat, they would introduce themselves. They they would recite poetry, and they would introduce themselves by speaking about who their ancestors were. That that I am I am Fulan, the son of Fulan, the son of Fulan. So you, we even see that on the day of Ashura, you know, many of the companions of Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam, they took pride in uh, their, their ancestors, in their, uh, their noble uh, forefathers. 
So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by granting the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, nobility of birth, he essentially ensured that the, pe the people of Mecca had no reason to discredit him. So Allah ensured that his final prophet is to be of the most noble birth so that the people of Mecca, who are a people who place great emphasis on who a person's father is and who their forefathers are, they essentially have no reason to, uh, to discredit him uh, and turn away from him. And you notice that when the Prophet ﷺ announced his mission, the Arabs insulted him. You know, they called him Majnoon, they called him a Sahar, they called him a madman, a magician. But you find that we have no nothing recorded in, in their insults that mentions that he comes from a lowly family. It is, it is acknowledged by all, even his most fierce enemies, that this is a man who comes from a very pure uh, lineage. He comes from a very pure and noble and a very distinguished ancestral uh, line. Now, in Shia Islam, we believe that all of the Prophet's ancestors were monotheists. All of them were muwahidun. They were monotheists. They believed in one God and they worshipped one God. Alam al-Majlisi, rahmatullahi alayhi, in Bihar al-Anwar, in volume 15, page 117, he speaks about he speaks about the Prophet's ancestors. And he says, اتفقت الإمامية رضوان الله عليهم على أن والدي الرسول وكل أجداده إلى آدم عليه السلام كانوا مسلمين. He says that there is a consensus among the imamis, among the twelve or Shias, that the Prophet's parents, his mother Amina, his father Abdullah, and all of his ancestors going back to Adam, all of them were Muslims in its general sense, meaning that they, they all submitted to the one true God. And here, Alam al-Majlisi, he says that, بَلْ كَانُوا مِنَ الصِّدِّيقِينَ That not only were they monotheists, they were صِدِّيقِينَ They were exemplary individuals. إِمَّا أَنْبِيَاءُ مُرْسَلِينَ أَوْ أَوْصِيَاءُ مَعْصُومِينَ Alam al-Majlisi, and there are other Shia scholars who, who believe this, he says, in fact, they were Siddiqeen. All of the Prophet's ancestors were either prophets who were sent by God, or they were sinless successors of prophets. They were awsiya. And, and then he says, لم يظهر الإسلام لتقية أو لمصلحة دينية. علام المجلس he says, and perhaps some of them, meaning some of the prophet's ancestors, did not reveal their faith due to تقية or some religious benefit. Perhaps because the majority were were polytheists, they felt that they it, it wasn't uh, safe for them uh, to reveal uh, their, uh, their religious beliefs. So they had to conceal their beliefs uh, for the sake of their own protection or for the sake of a greater good that they, uh, they perceived. It is narrated that Imam al-Baqir and Imam al-Sadiq, our fifth and sixth Imams, they say that they, they once said of the Prophet's noble ancestral line, Lam yazal. يُنْقَلْ مِنْ صُلْبِ نَبِيٍ إِلَى نَبِي He, the Prophet, was continually transferred from the loin of one Prophet to another. And then Imam al-Sadiq and Imam al-Baqir, they explain that, that not all Prophets are dispatched by God to, to guide communities that when we say that all of the prophets ancestors were prophets or successors of prophets 
this doesn't mean Imam al Baqir, Imam al Sadiq, they say it is not necessary for all prophets of God to be sent to communities. Not every prophet has a mission, meaning that. In fact, most of them, most of the Prophet's ancestors, they were possibly prophets for themselves, meaning that they were not given a mandate to take this message public and to guide people in, a, in, a, in, an, in an official capacity. Rather, they were prophets for themselves and for their households. They narrowly preserved the legacy of monotheism in their families, and they were not commanded by God to, to spread that message of monotheism because the time uh, was not conducive for that type of mission. Now, so who was Muhammad? Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi? So, this is the Prophet's ancestral tree going back to Ismail. So, he is Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, son of Abdullah his father, son of Abdul Muttalib, son of Hashim, son of Abd Manaf, son of Qusay, son of Kilab, son of Murra, son of Kaab, son of Lu'ay, son of Ghalib, son of Fihr, son of Malik, son of Nadr, and this is this is the man who he's the great 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 grandfather of the prophet his name is Nav and he was given the title of Quraysh now Quraysh literally means little shark Quraysh means shark and Quraysh means little shark and perhaps the reason why they were uh, given these names is because they they were not people who could be manipulated you know they were uh, they were not naive and they were likened to uh, to sharks, uh, so son of Nadr, son of Kinana, son of Adnan. So again, uh, these are the Arabized uh, Arabs, the Adnani Arabs, Al Arab al Musta'riba, son of Adnan and son of uh, Ismail. Now, the majority of Sunni scholars maintain that the Prophet's ancestors his parents, his grandparents, his great-grandparents, they were disbelievers and were in fact idol worshippers. The dominant view in the Sunni tradition is that the Prophet's parents, grandparents, great-grandparents were kuffar, they were mushrikeen, and they will ultimately, uh, they, they ultimately uh, did not believe in the oneness uh, of God. Now, there are some Sunni ulama who have challenged this belief. There are some Sunni scholars who believe that the Prophet's parents, for example, were following the, the, the way of Ibrahim. They were following the Abrahamic tradition. They were, you know, uh, they were following the following a uh, Adin al Hanif. Uh, they were Hanifis essentially. So you have Al Mas'udi, who is a Sunni historian, Al Yaqubi, Al uh, Fakhr Razi, for example, believes that the Prophet's parents, uh, he doesn't believe that they were Mushrikeen. A Suyuti, just to name a few prominent Sunni ulama who diverged from the traditional view that the Prophet's ancestors were uh, Mushrikeen. Now, what is the evidence to support this claim? Is there any evidence that we have? to establish that the Prophet's ancestors were in fact monotheists. Now, there are a number of uh, proofs that are mentioned. The first is that we have narrations that speak of the purity of the origin of the Prophet's creation. And this is a, a, a tradition that's mentioned in, uh, in Shia hadith books, and it's also mentioned in some Sunni hadith references. Now, of course, this is not mentioned in the Sahah, but there are other uh, Sunni scholars of hadith who have mentioned uh, this, uh, this riwayah. Where the Prophet ﷺ, he says, لَمْ يَزَلْ يَنْقُلُنِ اللَّهُ مِنْ أَصْلَابِ الطَّاهِرِينَ إِلَىٰ أَرْحَامِ الْمُطَهَّرَاتِ حَتَّى أَخْرَجَنِي فِي عَالَمِكُمْ وَلَمْ يُدَنِّسْنِي بِدَنَسِ الْجَاهِلِيَّةِ The Prophet says, 
God continuously transferred me from the loins of the pure to the wombs of pure uh, to the wombs of the pure until I emerged into this world and did not stain me with the stain of ignorance. Now Sunni ulama when they look at this hadith assuming that they accept it as an authentic tradition they say when the prophet says that God transferred me min aslab al-tahirin from the pure loins into the pure wombs they say that purity here means that he was not born out of wedlock that the prophet was not born out of fornication he was born through a legitimate marriage so sunni ulama they understand tahara to mean that he was not born out of adultery or fornication now shia scholars they say that this is تخصيص بلا مخصص that what 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 is the reason why you restrict the meaning of purity to purity of birth meaning that he was not he was not born out of wedlock when a term is used we don't we don't restrict the absoluteness of the term in this context because we we have no indication that it only means purity in terms of uh, being not being born out of wedlock so when the prophet says that i come from pure uh, loins and i was deposited in pure wombs it's purity in its in its absolute in its general sense and especially considering so we have no reason to limit the meaning of purity to one specific type of purity the prophet says i come from pure loins and pure wombs so we understand it to be purity in its absolute sense and especially the when it comes to uh especially considering that the greatest impurity the greatest spiritual impurity is shirk as the quran says ya ayyuhalladhina amanu in surah at-tawbah verse 28 ya ayyuhalladhina amanu innama al-mushrikuna najasun o you who believe indeed the polytheists are impure so if the prophet's ancestors were mushrikeen on what grounds is the prophet saying that i was transferred from you know min aslab al-tahirin ila arham al-mutahharat so those who say that tahara in this tradition refers to the fact that the prophet was not born out of wedlock we ask on what basis are you restricting the meaning of purity to that specific meaning the the the, the word purity is general and therefore we we are uh, uh we apply it in a in a very general and absolute way unless we have evidence to restrict the meaning of purity in this context we also have some quranic verses that allude to the purity of the prophet's uh ancestors in terms of the fact in terms of uh their spiritual beliefs and of course these uh, narrations are understood when we look at uh, the ahadith of Ahlul Bayt. Uh, we have in Surah 26, verses 218 and 219, Allah says, yara Allah is the one who sees you when you arise and your movement among those who prostrate. Now, the riwayat, the traditions of Ahlul Bayt, they say that the movement of the prophet among those who prostrate it means the movement of his life seed in their wombs the movement of the prophet's life seed from the loins to the wombs over uh, generations we also have a uh, a verse from surah 43 ayah 28 where allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the legacy of monotheism we know that Ibrahim السلام, was virtually the only monotheist in his community. And Allah says, And he made it. And a word remaining among his descendants, meaning God made La ilaha illallah, he made Tawheed a word that remains among his descendants. Now, if there is, if there is, if you look at the, the prophet and his connection to Ibrahim, if there are 
people from the descendants of uh, of Ibrahim from the line of Ismail who are not monotheists who are mushrikeen meaning that if if you have Ismail and then you have a line of mushrikeen until the prophet that means that the divine promise was not fulfilled because God did not make that legacy of tawhid continue among his descendants that's another argument that has been put forward by uh, by some scholars now some sunni scholars they they've offered a counter argument and they say that the quran describes the father of ibrahim as a disbeliever and therefore it is possible for prophets to descend from disbelievers they say we have an example in the quran so in Surah 9, verse 114, Allah says, وَمَا كَانَ اسْتِغْفَارُ إِبْرَاهِيمَ إِلَّا عَمَّ And the request of forgiveness of Abraham, for his father was only because of a promise he made to him. But when it became apparent to Abraham that his father was an enemy to God, he disassociated himself from him. So here, the argument by some, some Sunni scholars is that Ibrahim's father was an enemy of God. He was a manufacturer of idols. So here is an example of a prophet who is a descendant of a kafir. Now the response is, number one, Azar is not the biological father of Ibrahim. And we have historical evidence for this. Number two, the word walid in Arabic is exclusively used for the biological parent. Whereas the word ab can be used to refer to other than the biological father. So here when Allah says, وَمَا كَانَ اسْتِغْفَارُ إِبْرَاهِيمَ لِأَبِيهِ Who says that the meaning of ab in this ayah refers to his biological father? Because we know in, Arab, in Arabic, ab can be used to refer to a person's uncle. And we have a Quranic, uh, an, a Quranic precedent for this. In Surah, in surah Al-Baqarah verse 133, Allah says, Am kuntum shuhada Yaqub al -maut. Were you witnesses when death approached Jacob? When he said to his sons, What will you worship after me? What was the response? That we will worship your God and the God of your fathers. Aba is the plural of Ab. So, so Yaqub, so who are the fathers of Yaqub? Ibrahim is his grandfather. Ismail is his, his great uncle. And Ishaq is his father. So the word Ab is used here to refer to a biological father. And it's used to refer to a great uncle. And it's used to refer to a, a, a grandfather. So even in the Quran, you see that the word Eb can be used for a, uh, an uncle. Furthermore, in Surah at tawbah we mentioned that Ibrahim disassociates himself from his father. He doesn't do istighfar for his father because he, he is essentially an enemy of God. When it became apparent to Ibrahim that his father was an enemy to God, he disassociated himself from him. You see that in the Quran, Ibrahim actually makes dua for his biological parents. Praise to God. Who has granted me in old age Ismail and Ishaq? Inna Rabbi la dua. Indeed, my Lord is the hearer of supplication. Rabbi jani muqim al salat wa min dhuriyati Rabbana wa taqabbil dua. My Lord, make me an establisher of prayer and many from my descendants. And then he says, 
ربنا اغفر لي ولوالدي وللمؤمنين يوم يقوم الحساب Our Lord forgive me and my parents Here notice that Ibrahim says He doesn't say اغفر لي ولأبوي اغفر لي ولوالدي Forgive me and my parents So would Ibrahim make dua for someone who is an enemy of God? So here the fact that Ibrahim makes dua for his parents indicates that this is not the same person that is mentioned in Surah 9 verse 114. Now you may ask, why is there so much insistence by some Muslims that the Prophet's parents and forefathers are disbelievers? It seems that there's an obsession with this, that no, Abdullah, Amina, Abu Talib, Abdul Muttalib, the Prophet's forefathers, they were all mushrikeen, they're all kuffar, and they're all in the hell, in the hellfire. Why this insistence on the fact that they are mushrikeen? Now, we have to understand that, you know, many of these narrations are actually fabricated by the enemies of Ahlul Bayt to diminish the, stat, the stature of the Prophet and his Ahlul Bayt. You know, you take, for example, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. You know, the Umayyads, for example, they had so much jealousy and enmity towards Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib that it actually drove them to disparage his forefathers because the overwhelming majority of the companions of the Prophet, they their parents were kuffar, they were mushrikeen. So it seems that many of them, especially the Umayyads, in order to equalize themselves with the Prophet, they said, yes, our, our ancestors were kuffar, but so, was, so, were, so were the Prophet's ancestors. And, and they did this specifically as an attack against Ali ibn Abi Talib. And of course, when you disparage the forefathers of Ali ibn Abi Talib, you, you end up disparaging the Prophet's forefathers because they, sh they, sh they share the same uh, ancestral uh, line. Now, just as a, a conclusion to our discussion, I want to mention uh, two of the Prophet's uh, forefathers, and inshallah, uh, in our next episode, we'll speak in a little bit more detail about the Prophet's grandfather, Abdul Muttalib. Now, one of the Prophet's ancestors, who is the, the great, great grandfather of the Prophet, who is definitely worthy of mention, is Qusay. Now, Qusay is a significant figure in the prophets uh, among the prophets forefathers because he actually rebuilt the Kaaba and we know that throughout history the Kaaba was was damaged because of you know exposure to the elements because of flooding so the Kaaba was was rebuilt many times throughout history it was rebuilt by by Ibrahim by people throughout uh, throughout the generations so Qusay actually rebuilds the Kaaba and he constructs a roof on the, the Kaaba. So he, he's famously known for erecting a roof for, uh, for the Kaaba to you know, protect it from flooding and, uh, and damage. He also does something that's, uh, that's very interesting. And he, he actually establishes Darul Nadwa, which is basically a meeting room in Mecca, it's an assembly room that used to face uh, Mount Safa. So this, you know, you can think of it as an ancient parliament where you, where people can kind of come together, they can voice their opinions, present their grievances. So it was kind of like a city hall, a town hall that was established uh, by Qusay because he really cared about what people had to say. He wanted to give a voice to the residents of, um, of Mecca and allow uh, some conversations to, uh, to be had about how to improve uh, the region. Now at this time, of course, there is no well of, of Zamzam. And, and this is where you see that uh, Qusay actually suggests, because he says to his, his fellow uh, tribesmen, he says to the Quraysh, that you know, we live here, we are the custodians of, of the Kaaba. When pilgrims come to perform Hajj, 
we have to be hospitable. You know, we're hosting them. They're in our city. And he suggests to Quraysh that free food and water be given to the religious, uh, to, to be given to the pilgrims. So he establishes this practice of giving food to, uh, to the Hujjaj and really creating this sense of responsibility that we, the Quraysh, as the hosts of uh, Mecca, we should treat pilgrims as honorable guests and we should provide them with, with food and with accommodations and we should treat them with the utmost uh, dignity. Now, then we come to Hashim. Now, Hashim was the great grandfather of the Prophet. Of course, the family of the Prophet is known as, as Beni Hashim and they take their name from the Prophet's great-grandfather. Now, his real name was actually Amr. Hashim was a title that was given to him, and the word, the title Hashim literally means the breaker of bread. Historians mention, they say, وَإِنَّمَا سُمِّيَ هَاشِمًا لِهَشَمِّهِ الثَّرِيدِ لِلْحَاجِ He was called Hashim, because he used to break bread and he used to pour stew over it for the, uh, the pilgrims. Now, Mecca was actually a very poor uh, region. It was a very poor city. Uh, and you can imagine, you know, it doesn't really have any natural resources. Uh, you know, Zemzem had not been uh, discovered yet. So Hashim witnessed mass poverty in Mecca. And, you know, being the honorable man that he was, he wanted to do something to improve the economic well-being of the people of Mecca, of his own tribesmen, his relatives, and those who visit the city. So he figured that, you know, that people come to Mecca, you know, Mecca is a religious destination. There are already hundreds and thousands of people who come to Mecca on a regular basis. They come throughout the year to perform the religious pilgrimage. So in his mind, you know, we already have this influx of customers. So why don't we establish a trading center in Mecca and sell goods and services to these, to these people who are descending upon Mecca throughout the year and especially during the Hajj season? So what he does is that he actually establishes two annual trading expeditions. He is the one who builds the infrastructure for the trading expeditions to Syria in the summer and the trading expeditions to Yemen during the winter. And of course, Syria was known for its contacts with the Persian and the Roman Empire. You know, people were able to procure uh, Persian and Roman goods from Syria, especially silk, like Istabarak, the finest silk, came from Syria. Yemen, because of its connections with, uh, with India and the subcontinent uh, and the Indian Ocean, they, uh, they were able to procure some, uh, you know, some spices and some important food goods from that region. So you see that this, this Rahla to Shita, it was safe, which is mentioned in Surah Quraysh. This was actually established by Hashim, the great grandfather of the prophet. And therefore, it's no exaggeration to say that Hashim actually saved the Arabs from starvation. You know, the Arabs who were living in Mecca and in some of their surrounding regions, they were so poor that many of them had, they had graves that were already dug because people were so weak and they were so mal malnutritioned that you know just to make just to make it easier for those who remain behind people would dig their own graves so if someone dies the grave is already dug there's no need to expend any further energy you just put them in the grave you put the dirt over and it's and it's done so hashim actually saves the Arabs by establishing these, uh, these trading routes. And he, he, he essentially uh, establishes uh, 
the city of Mecca as a city of uh, of commerce. Now, naturally, Hashem, you know, with his business acumen and his and his ethics and his care for people and his intelligence, he became the wealthiest man in Arabia. In fact, just to give you an idea of how wealthy, so he was that rare combination of immense wealth and immense generosity. He was so wealthy, brothers and sisters, that Hashim used to feed all of the pilgrims with his personal income. So people who would come to Hajj, Hashim would use his own personal income to provide them with water, to provide them with food. Now Hashim had a brother by the name of Abd Shams. Abd Shams had a son or son, they say it's an adopted son by the name of Umayyah. And this is where you have Bani Umayyah. Now Abd Shams became deeply jealous of the wealth and the fame of his brother Hashim. And this is where the animosity between Bani Hashim and Bani Umayyah begins. You know, you know, we think that this animosity, you know, was sparked during the time of the Prophet Imam Ali Imam Al Hussein. This tension actually existed even before the birth of the Prophet. So Bani Umayyah, they're essentially the children of uh, Abd Shams. Abd Shams had a son or an adopted son by the name of uh, Umayyah. So this rivalry between Bani Hashim and Bani Umayyah began during the lifetime of Hashim, especially when he became wealthy. Now, Hashim had uh, multiple wives. One of his wives was from Yathrib. And as we mentioned, uh, Yathrib is where many of the pure Arabs reside. So you have the Qahtani Arabs uh, who, who trace back their lineage to the, the, uh, the people of of Sheba. So Hashem marries a woman from Yathrib, which is the ancient name for the city of Medina. And he has a child with this woman by the name of Sheba. And this is the actual name of Abdul Muttalib. And inshallah, we'll speak about, uh, about the birth of Abdul Muttalib and what happened to Hashem. And, uh, and, and therefore you see that the the prophet's uh, the prophet's great grandmother is essentially from Yathrib. So you see how Allah Subhanahu wa Taala the, the work of God at play. How the prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has uh, relatives. He has blood relatives who are from the city of Yathrib. So it's interesting that uh, Yathrib becomes the place of his refuge uh, when later on there is an attempt. To assassinate him, uh, I think we'll conclude there, and inshallah, we'll uh, we'll carry on this uh, discussion in our next uh, episode. Uh, thank you so much for uh, for lending me your ears uh, during this hour. Wa sallallahu ala Muhammad wa alihi tahirin. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad ajil farajah. Any questions or comments before we conclude? Uh, so, could you please explain what the Arabs knew about the uh, the perished Arabs from, but before the Quranic revelations told more about them? So, about the people of Ad and Tamud. Now, as you can imagine, <clears throat> the Quraysh, you know, the Arabs, they had a very strong oral culture. You know, the people who were able to read were uh, who were literate were very far and few in between. So, many of them were familiar with the uh, the fate of Ad and Thamud, you know, because of the stories that were passed down from generation to generation. It's also very possible that uh, the, the ruins of those civilizations still exist. I mean, after all, Ad and Thamud occupied and they, uh, they lived in the Arabian Peninsula. So the Arabs were familiar with, uh, with Ad and Thamud, and because of the the stories that were passed down from generation to generation, and also because of the you know just the archaeological findings that were probably 
available at that time. So there were uh, presumably traces uh, of those uh, perished uh, nations. Uh, and on the dua that um, Hazrat uh, Prophet Abraham made, uh, it says to make the peace, some people supply them like uh, with fruits so that they can learn to be thankful. Uh, why? Uh, who, who is it referring to that they can learn to be thankful? And what was the significance of that? Let me pull up the, uh, the verse. <clears throat> so when you look at this verse, So here you have Ibrahim alayhi salam placing his Hajar and Ismail in this barren land. And you could see how the plan of God is unfolding. You know, it's essentially planting a seed in this region for, you know, uh, the final messenger of God to emerge from that land. So, you know, why is he placing them there? Why is he leaving them in this barren valley? So they can establish prayer so they can create a culture whereby people can connect to their creator uh, because salah essentially means uh, you know a connection to God now some scholars they say that this is actually a reference to the to the Ahlul Bayt because the Ahlul Bayt they are from the progeny of Ismail and here Ibrahim is asking God to make the hearts of people inclined to them. And we see that the Imams of Ahlul Bayt would often refer to this verse as one of the great favors that God has conferred upon them because he made it in the fitrah of people to be inclined towards them because they are the embodiment of, of, of human virtue. And it's, it's natural for people to be inclined towards the beautiful qualities such as courage and wisdom and... and uh, and valor and patience. Uh, now, <clears throat> so, you know, this shows you that this is a barren land, but because of the dua of Ibrahim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places great rizq in this land. Of course, rizq can be spiritual or material but we have we see examples of how this barren desert we see with with the emergence of of zemzem it becomes inhabitable uh it becomes a place where 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 the the the, the resources of the earth are available and now especially in, in modern times we know that you know these regions are sitting over oceans of uh, of oil, so Allah has put a lot of barakah in these lands. You know, why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us uh blessings so we can learn gratitude? And, and gratitude essentially means the highest level of gratitude is to use those blessings in, in, in for their intended purpose, to use it in a way that is pleasing uh, to the Creator. Thank you. And um, what are the sources that will be used in the series? Is the work of investigation done by, say, Jafar Murtza Al Amali will be included? Yeah. So, so one of one of my primary sources for uh, for these lectures is uh, Al Sahih Min Sirat Al Nabi Al A'zam, the which is a thirty five volume work, which is an analysis of the Prophet's biography and really. You know, uh, Sayyid Murtal al amri who recently passed away, he spent uh, many, many years uh, looking at the Prophet's biography and 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 trying to authenticate what is actually accurate. You know, in the same way that you know we go through, we have a process of authentication when it comes to hadith. He does this with uh, the uh, the biographical sources, and he and he does a lot of what I mentioned in the first lecture. He when he, he takes any historical account about the prophet, he he uh, he refers it back to the Quran, back to the 
well-established narrations of Ahlul Bayt, and he discards anything that is inconsistent with the Quranic descriptions of the Prophet, and he does a lot of you know historical investigation. So I will definitely draw from his work, and uh, uh, there's also a uh, uh, التاريخ الإسلامي that I'll be using so there are a number of sources that I'll be using but that will be definitely uh, one of the, the primary uh, references that I'll be using Is the family history that was connecting the Prophet to Prophet Ismail considered a full or a partial chain of ancestry? It's considered a partial chain because I don't think that Adnan is the direct son of Ismail but just some of the more prominent uh, uh, figures are mentioned there. Some say that it was the direct uh, descendant of Ismail, but I would say that it's kind of just uh, a rough uh, uh, tree connecting the Prophet to uh, to Ismail. And could you talk a little bit about how Zamzam was not discovered or was not known about if it had been discovered during Prophet Ismail's time? So I'll, I'll, I'm going to be speaking about that next week, inshallah. When we speak about Abdul Muttalib, I'll give a background on the uh, the history of Zemzem and and what what led uh, to its uh, so 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 you see so Zemzem it existed during the time of uh, of Ismail you know Hajar and Ismail so what happened why did it get lost and 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 how was it rediscovered Inshallah we'll we'll I'll save that for next week. And is it true that Amaya was of Roman ancestry if we accept that he is the adopted son of Abd Shams? I'm not sure about his his uh, his background. There is a, there is a debate among scholars over whether he's a son or a, an adopted son. I'm not sure yet. I don't I, I don't think there's an agreement among the ulama. You'll see both opinions, but I, I'm not familiar with uh, whether or not he would be from uh, a Roman background. I doubt it. I I, I presume that he he was an Arab. And of the different, of the Qatani or Adani Arabs, do Arabs nowadays tend to know which kind they, they are? Arabs today don't even speak proper Arabic. So I don't think that they would even know if, uh, if they're Qahtani or Adnani. No, I, I would say that the overwhelming majority don't know. Well, uh, thank you very much, Sheikh. Jazakumullah. Thank you so much for listening. And I look forward to... Uh, uh, our session next week, inshallah.